it's my pleasure to speak about the ethic committee blessing on, or curse. And um, maybe I choose this title because as a legal person, I always ask myself about the legitimacy of ethic committees. And as Christian, who was introducing me already very nicely this morning, uh, said, uh, I'm also responsible for the Austrian National Bioethics Commission, as for the past 20 years, uh, my principal work is for the Research Ethic Committee. And people usually, if they're not experts like you all here, they completely uh, confuse those two committees. So my talk will uh, turn around a bit uh, of those two committees. I just wanted to add uh, to Kim's talk that Austria has for the past 15 years active involvement of patient representatives in Austrian ethic committees. So in some respects, although the awareness is low, uh, we are quite well advanced. So my starting point here is the freedom of research, which everybody has guaranteed by the Austrian constitution. But uh, freedom is only going as far as it is not uh, in conflict with some other rights. And here we have to think about the protection of the rights and the integrity of patients and healthy volunteers. And of course, uh, which is getting more and more important, the awareness of scientific integrity, of the integrity of the data, and of course of public trust. The other starting point is uh, that I, as I already said, would like to start uh, referring to two types of ethic committees. The bioethic committees, which we do have in our landscape uh, of research since the 1980s. France had established the first one in 1983, Austria and Germany in 2001. And also the other focus is research ethic committees, which we have since the first amendment of the Declaration of Helsinki in the year 1978. There is still a third type of ethic committee which might be confused with the other one, but this is really uh, an ethic committee which is a consulting body uh, for decisions like end-of-life decisions, allocation uh, decisions and other types. I'm not going to talk about that. <coughs> Those are the three uh, ethic committees which easily might be confused. So if we look uh, at the title and blessing occurs, and I'm looking from the point of view of the researcher who is burdened with all the requirements for submission, but he sees uh, an ethic committee in some ways as a blessing because his prime thought, uh, among others, is his career and how to improve his impact factor. And of course, an ethic committee is quite some step to improve the impact factor because otherwise he would never be able to publish his uh, findings. Or, which is also happening lately, how to avoid a conflict with an editor of a medical journal because this is also something which happens. Sometimes the medical journals have a much wider understanding of what needs to be done from the ethic point of view than the laws we do have in our specific countries and the soft laws, which we also have additionally to the national laws. So it might also be a curse in some way because it's all this additional bureaucracy. And from the point of view of the research community in general, I would uh, like to quote uh, something uh, from uh, the intensive care medicine a few uh, years ago, but this is uh, maybe it stands for other uh, um, opinions as well. On the visual analogs, oops, how does that work? On the visual analog scale, the subjective evaluation of the effort required to submit a study draft to an ethic committee or enter it in a clinical trials register produced almost only negative grades in both groups. Mm -hmm. So we see that there is quite some critique also which leads to the curse. So in regard to research ethic committees, there's quite a lot we have to do to make them better in some way. There is the legitimacy, 
about the appointment of members, the training of members, the legal quality of opinions. These are all things which need some way or other to be regulated. There's the requirement of submission beyond the law, which I refer to talking about the editors of medical journals. And there's a completely heterogeneous situation throughout the world, which, of course, is terrible for multi-center research, not only for the burden of investigators, which they have to do because they need to find out uh, how to deal with the different uh, requirements of ethic committees, but it's also very difficult for the quality of the data because we might end up with a selection bias because we have different types of patients within the same clinical trial to be included. And there is something which we called in our committee when we were discussing this issue, uh, the parallel world of ethic committees, or a term coined by the Lancet of quite some years ago, the ethics industry. And this is something where we definitely see uh, room for improvement. The other thing is that ethic committees rather tend to protect the single patient because they are, while they are reviewing the protocols, thinking of how can we uh, maintain the integrity and rights of the single patient. But this, again, might be in conflict with the idea of public health. So there is another problem we have. When you are sitting together with ethic committee members, of course, their uh, ideas are that researchers do something which might be wrong, or they tend not to observe the way the ethic committee expects all the regulations. So instead of emphasizing in the public how good it is that we have research, that our lives have improved, that the quality of our life has improved, that we have therapies and diagnoses for diseases we didn't have many years ago, uh, they tend to uh, we talk mainly about the failures or the problems in the room for improvement of research, which is a problem. And then there is something which has already been addressed before. We had a complete, or we are witnessing a complete change of paradigm. We have all our regulations for clinical research dating from the 1950s, 1960s, after World War II, when we had to face those crimes which were conducted by Nazi physicians, but not only by those in concentration camps uh, and other uh, misconducts of research, Tuskegee and other things. So at that time, clinical research was an experiment, something which really was uh, um, done on the body of the research uh, participant. And now, most of the research uh, protocols we see are minor risk, minor burden, but maybe high in data accumulation. For instance, all the biobank research, which is very important for uh, the development of uh, our therapeutics, but is a completely different approach to uh, the person included in the clinical research. So we need some better legal foundation for the establishment, for the composition of ethic committees. And we need, this is something which is completely neglected, a financial commitment of uh, the research uh, uh, responsible um, authorities. And we need training for the ethic committee members, an initial training and ongoing training, and of course, a type of quality control for their decisions. So I'm looking back a bit also about the bioethic committees, which are established to uh, consult governments or the House of Parliaments in general questions of the life science. They're not dealing like the, ethic, the research ethic committee with the single protocol for a single project, but they're dealing with general questions of uh, research, stem cell research, uh, all sorts of other types. And here, if I quote a very recent Lancet uh, a recession of a book, uh, the biggest hazard faced by the perhaps too well-funded bioethics industry is grandiosity. Its employees are addicted to overstatement, hysteria, and to an ingrained inability 
to separate fact from fiction. So we see that also there is some room for improvement. And the improvement means that we have a terrible risk of the politicization of ethics because it can be instrumentalized, especially as we know that there are different opinions, different opinions regarding to culture, regarding to the religious belief, and so on. And this is a problem because we are living in culturally and morally diverse societies, and we need, by those committees, which are expert committees, an expert opinion founded on the science, and not only on their religious belief. We have sometimes competing bodies. Who appoints it? Is it the parliament? Is it the government? Those are all things which have to be uh, figured out. And sometimes we can witness also an alibi function of those committees. And sometimes we also see that there is the opinion, we are all experts now, so why do we need really the scientific experts? But there is a huge potential in all these committees, and this is the blessing we are witnessing. The potential is that bioethics is a privileged mediator between the science, the politics, and the public. Because we all know that the public needs to be much more involved in such questions. Such committees are directed at assessing the risk, and the risk, uh, uh, because uh, now we are so advanced in our science that the risk is not easily to be evaluated by people who are not firm in these topics. And if you look uh, at the uh, data we have assembled for a publication in the Intensive Care Medicine in 2009, we have a complete heterogeneous situation and for some countries we have very many committees, in others we have uh, quite uh, few, and this has nothing to do with the amount of science which is done in those countries, nor with the population in this country. So I think there should also be some room for improvement to avoid conflicting uh, uh, decisions of ethic committees. So we need some united endeavors for a change to be really able to say that ethic committees are a blessing for all of us. It, we in Austria, the Bioethics <coughs> Commission, we have uh, this January issued an opinion of the necessity of a codification of a human research law. We do have in Austria, Tierversuchsgesetz, a research law for animal research, but we do not have any for human research. And this is a problem because the different laws are scattered and difficult for the researcher and for the other people, to, for the ethic committee members to oversee. We have issued a book about these uh, problems uh, last year. So there is ample uh, food for thought in this respect. To sum it up, uh, is are they a curse or a blessing? I would say the answer is very clear. We need ethic committees. We need them for the protection of the patients and the volunteers. We need them, and this is extremely important, as a support for the investigator in their investigation and plan. And we need them to have and establish and maintain trust in the public that everything is working out well in clinical research. But needless to say, they need to strive from inside, from themselves, to be better, to even, to always be better again, and to be accepted by researchers and by society. And I thank you very much.